Hi there, welcome to Beauty at Work. We're in between seasons at the moment, so please check out this clip from one of our episodes. Some scientists find a theory of everything incredibly beautiful. But is such a theory worth pursuing? According to award-winning physicist and author Dr. Marcelo Gleiser, the answer is no. In this clip, he explains why the pursuit of unity in science has been misleading. Check it out. I remember in the 1980s when I was in grad school, you know, the, the zeitgeist was, hey, we are going to be able to put the whole of the universe in a T-shirt in a single equation. Right, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> and that yeah. was like, wow. I mean, how could you not be wowed by such a possible adventure, right? I mean, I mean, so as, as a young theoretical physicist, I said, of course I have to go after this. I, I need to be part of this group, you know, of people that are trying. So in the 80s, you know, when I was doing my PhD in England, I, I did join the string theory, which was by the time, you know, the most powerful way of thinking about these mathematical hidden structures. And I'm like, Einstein himself spent the last 20 years of his life trying to find the so-called unified theory. And he failed, but it was a very valiant attempt, so to speak. And I'm like, I just want to keep doing this. I mean, what privilege, you know, to have a life where you can actually spend your time teaching people about the beauty of, of science and pursuing the deepest secret of all, right? So I was completely enamored by the whole idea of going for it, you know, finding the theory of everything. Right, 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 right. So, so what happened then? I mean, you, you, you essentially distanced yourself from that pursuit of, of unification. Right. Yeah, so then I grew up. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> what happened is, yes, you know, I pursued this. I wrote lots of papers. My PhD thesis was on stuff like this. And my postdoc, my first postdoc in particular at Fermilab, which is a big high energy physics lab, is the CERN of the United States, so to speak, uh, was um, very much devoted to this until I went to the University of California in Santa Barbara to do my second postdoc at the Institute for Theoretical Physics. I, I guess now it's called the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics, where I met not just people that were working in high energy physics, you know, string theory and cosmology, but actually folks that were working in condensed matter physics, phase transitions, more applied stuff. And then I realized that the universe of physics was much broader than this kind of a semi, uh, I would call it semi-religious pursuit of the theory of everything, like this monotheistic way of thinking about the world. That, in a sense, what was really interesting to most of these people was not the perfect symmetries. Of course, they are very useful, right? And we use them all the time. But it was really the asymmetries of things. And then I started to say, but wait, you know, it's not just them, because in particle physics, asymmetries are extremely important, right? Because if you start to look at things um, more carefully, the asymmetry in nature plays a tremendous role. And one of the most important of them, I can go and list a bunch of them, but one of them is the famous matter-antimatter asymmetry. So what does that mean, right? The idea here is, okay, we're all made of matter, like of electrons and protons, etc. But there's this other kind of particle in nature, which is called antiparticle. And people say, ooh, does it go up uh, in gravity? Does it have a sort of mysterious? And, and the, the answer is no. You know, basically, antimatter is simply matter with sort of different properties. So an electron has negative charge, but it has a certain mass. And the antiparticle, so the, it's sort of like a mirror world, right? And the antiparticle of the electron is called the positron. Positron, positive. It just means it's very much like the electron, but it has the opposite electric charge, right? And we see those things, and it's really beautiful that particle physics has discovered this kind of matter. It all started, in, believe it or not, it started almost 100 years ago with, with Paul Dirac, you know, when he wrote an equation that basically predicted the existence of these things. They found it. And then the big problem became, wait a second, because if you have as many particles of matter as particles of antimatter in the universe, what would happen is that every time those two collide, 
they disintegrate into a puff of very high energy electromagnetic waves, like they're called gamma rays, but so very high energy light. So if matter and antimatter existed at the same, in the same amounts in the universe, we wouldn't be here. The universe would yeah. be a completely different place. It would be a place filled with radiation and not much more. So without that imbalance that exists in nature between matter and antimatter, there is more matter than antimatter, we wouldn't be here. And then the question becomes, why? You know, why is there such an asymmetry at, at the fundamental level? And nobody knows, right? And what we do know, and here's really interesting, is that this asymmetry somehow is related to another kind of asymmetry, which is very existential, which is the asymmetry in time. So it turns out that the asymmetry that relates matter and antimatter is related to the fact that we all know that time always flows forward, right? Yeah. And there's a deep entanglement of these ideas there that we still do not understand. But long story short, when I started to think more about not just the symmetries, but the fact that what we want is not so much the symmetry, but we want to break those symmetries, because when you break the symmetries is when stuff happens, right? And you look around yourself and you say, okay, where is perfection in nature, right? I mean, is a rose perfect, symmetrically perfect? Is right. a cloud perfect? Is a tree perfect? Is your face perfect in terms of perfect? And you realize that it isn't. Right, that everything is imperfect in nature, and say this is trying to tell us something. You know that, yes, yeah, symmetry is a very profoundly efficient tool in physics and mathematics, and we use it all the time. But the nuances with which nature creates structures really come more from these imbalances than from a perfectly balanced nature. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I recently uh, interviewed Art Louis uh, at Oxford and their group. Um, now, they found that there, 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 there is a sort of disproportionate tendency for nature to produce symmetric shapes. But, um, but all of those symmetric shapes, and his argument is because, uh, you know, the, the algorithm is much simpler to generate symmetric things than non-symmetric things. But, um, but all of those symmetric shapes are, are slightly asymmetrical. There's, there's imperfection built into, into everything that we even consider symmetric. Uh, which is quite astounding. Um, at the level of laws, though, uh, I mean, that's that's one of the things, you know, I, I think Mario was talking about where physicists really care about symmetry matters for for laws to be translated across, you know, space and time and so on. Um, I mean, is that is that really essential for for laws of nature to exist? Do we need some kind of symmetry at that level? Or what do you think? I think that um, we have to understand something very, very important about laws of nature right that and uh it which is that everything that we humans do is an approximation to what's going on right everything that we describe as let's look at the moon and let's approximate the moon as a perfect sphere and then you say well as a perfect sphere you know if you rotate the moon in any possible direction if it's a perfect sphere you're going to get the same thing a perfect sphere has this beautiful rotational symmetry in every direction, but the moon doesn't because the moon is not a perfect sphere. So, you know, it's the, this joke that we have, let's consider a spherical cow, right, as, as an example of an approximation. But of course, and it is very useful as approximation. So I think what happens very often in physics and mathematics is that we confuse the map with the territory. And that's something that I think is very pertinent to this conversation because, you know, if you consider that the territory is what's really out there, okay, and what we do as humans is that we interact with physical reality through our senses and our instruments, and we create maps of the reality that we can see, right? And of course, a telescope and a microscope, they will expand the map, they'll make it more nuanced, but the map, and this is what's important, the map is never going to be a precise replica of the territory. It's always going to be an approximation of that territory, 
Right? Yeah, you don't, you don't want to, yeah, one-to-one map would be, like Borges says, yeah, well, that's exactly. the most useless sort of thing, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, the, 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 the perfect map, in, like in Borges, is that one paragraph short story is the territory, is as big as the territory, and that's just useless, right? But that, that sto- short story that I suggest everybody reads, you know, it's, it's, I think it's called On the Rigor of Science, uh, one of the translations is in English is... It, which is a one paragraph story, is that the futility of trying to pretend or the futility of believing that what we actually represent as nature is nature, you know, and forgetting that what we actually do is we approximate. And yes, within our approximations, absolutely, you know, symmetries are very, very important. They open gates to new discoveries, and, and that's beautiful and, and powerful, and of course we all have to do that, but we should not think that because our approximations describe nature as this perfect thing, like everything is perfectly conserved, and, you know, energy, is cons- energy momentum is conserved, and angular momentum is conserved, and electric charge is conserved, that that is how nature is. That is how nature is according to the way we look at nature. And I think that brings about a sense of humility because, you know, it would be profoundly arrogant, in my opinion, to believe that what we can say about the world is what the world is. What we can say about the world is what we as humans perceive of the world. And that is very much anchored in, first of all, in our experience of reality. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's let's talk about experience. I mean, you've you've um, you've written this this article recently about the the blind spot that that uh, many of us have, uh, particularly in science, when it comes to experience. Right? We discount the role of our our situated experience as humans, and that um, blind spot is is partly responsible for the uh, existence of scientific materialism as as a worldview. Could you say a bit about that? Yeah, so I just finished a book, actually, uh, oh, with, uh, <laughs> with Evan Thompson, a phenomenal philosopher from the University of British Columbia, and Adam Frank. Uh, and so it, the book is called The Blind Spot, right? And it's about experience and the idea of reality. And it is a very in-depth analysis and critique of how science sometimes tangles itself into knots by not understanding that there are blind spots in the way we look at reality. And the most fundamental of those blind spots, it's a, and this comes from a, a school of philosophy called phenomenology, um, you know, like uh, Edmund Husserl and uh, Alfred uh, North uh, Whitehead and people like that, where they say, um, do not confuse, you know, um, what you, how you describe reality for reality itself, which is very similar to what I was just saying before about the map and the territory. In fact, this analogy of the map and the territory appears all the time. And the blind spot is essentially the neglect of experience, our physical experience of the world, as being essentially where everything begins. So what we do is, you know, for, we use an example in the book, which is the example of temperature. Okay, what is temperature, right? And nowadays, we think of temperature as something that is real, right? Like temperature exists, is real, but temperature is not real. What is real is our sensation of hot and cold. That you feel, you feel hot, you feel cold, And then from that sensation, which is primal, you know, it's how it begins, to a description of these changes in sensation by something that we call temperature, you needed 300 years or more of science, okay? So to go and quantify by a thermometer what you mean by hot and cold, a lot of stuff had to happen. Right, And so again, the thermometer is a map of our sensation of temperature, but temperature itself doesn't exist. It's a construction, you know, it's a narrative that we are creating to describe ultimately what we mean by hot and cold. And what happens there is that 
if you look at the history of science and, and the way we structure the book is an MIT uh, press book that I hope will come out in about a year or so. Um, if you look at the history of science and we, the way we broke the book down into, let's see if I remember this, first the problem itself, then um, we do an analysis of time, you know, the notion of what is time, okay? That one is a very complicated story, right? I mean, the, the way physicists and philosophers talk about time. And then we go on to, I mean, St. Augustine, be, way before science, you know, had this thing about time, yeah. right? Um, and, and then we go into cosmology, you know, the no, notion of the origin of the universe. Is that a knowable question? Or is that an unknowable question? And why scientists tend to think that it's knowable and why we think it's unknowable um, within the framework of science, anyways. Um, and then we go on to talk about the concept of matter, materialism, right? And, you know, the notion of the existence of atoms and particles and quantum mechanics and how do you interpret quantum mechanics? And then we move on to um, the consciousness the nature of consciousness. And at the very end, we talk about the question of planetary awareness, you know, how, how, those, how those scientific notions kind of percolated through our mindset, especially across the Industrial Revolution, and even before then, to kind of position ourselves above everything else in nature, you know, and why that is a disastrous way of thinking about who we are, you know, in the, in the world right now. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. I mean, and, and, and this work has, has ramifications for, uh, I suppose, the kinds of philosophical assumptions a lot of scientists carry, right? And I think materialism is one of the ones that I think you critique in the article that I, that, that I think you put out uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, but that, that is a, a very attractive, beautiful prospect for, for some scientists who, who sort of think that that's one of the things modern science gives us is a secure foundation for understanding reality where you can dismiss the existence of anything that's non-material um what what do you what do you say to that yeah so so talking about these things is not saying that there is something else which is non-material you know i mean so there is you have to make a distinction here so there's not i mean we do not know right i mean right. So yeah. yeah we do not know but you could have a narrative of reality which is perfectly materialistic, um, but it's also aware of the fact that the way we describe the world is full of blind spots, right? And yeah. um, and you have to take that into account. So what what um, Alfred um, uh, Whitehead and um, and um, and Husserl said, and Marlo Ponty and friends said, is that you have to be careful not to reify your theories, meaning to make sure that what you think is energy and momentum is not something that exists in the world, but it's really a representation of how we measure the world. So before anything, science is really about our interaction with physical reality, either through our senses and or through our instruments. And so, you know, you say, look, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope is seeing this galaxy, which is 10 billion years old. And you say, yes, and it is. But there's a lot of translation that is going on here. The galaxy is there, right? There's no question yeah. about it. But and and but the way we interact with it, right, is through what? Finally, is through vision. I mean, you um, may have a, let's say, an ultraviolet telescope or an infrared telescope in the case of very far away things. We don't see an infrared. So we wouldn't see a thing, you know, but what we do is we remap the information from those images, which we cannot see, into things that we can see. So there is always this translation of what's out there to things that we can perceive through our senses. But people forget that, right? And, and they say, of course, my, uh, my field theory that describes electrons as quanta of a certain field is real. 
And that's the problem. You know, that's what's, what uh, Whitehead would call um, subreptitious subrep- substitution. You know, they're always a Whitehead or hustle, which is the idea that you are beginning to substitute, you know, a theory for something that is real. Mm, okay. mm. And a theory is not real. A theory is a representation of what's real. And yeah. that's the problem. So when people look for the symmetry, you know, you know, they we always forget that that theory, you know, for you guys who are scientists and physicists, you know, you write a Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is full of assumptions and simplifications about what it is that you're describing, you know. And it is a great approximation to what's going on. Just like Newton's theory of gravity is beautiful to describe how the moon goes around the earth all you need to know is the masses of each one of them the distances between them and bingo there you are but the moon and the earth are much more than just that you know that is just something that is useful to describe that particular so that is the danger you know when you start to think of your theories as the world as is as opposed to representations of the world Oh, that's a great. That's a great caution. I, I recall uh, Frank Wilczek talking about how we might get very different physics if we imagined doing physics from the perspective of a bird or or of a spider, um, right? So, because a bird, I think, would more naturally grasp relativism than than we would uh, relativity, rather. So, uh, yeah, there's a famous quote by Heisenberg before we go there, um, which says that what we see is not nature, but nature subject to our questioning. Meaning is the questions that we are asking about nature, that the ones that we try to respond. And that, in a sense, couches the whole conversation. There are all these other things out there that we are not asking questions about yet or have in the past that also nature, you know. And so, you know, but we are looking at nature in, of course, the more we advance scientifically, the more spectacular and the broader our our conversation is, you know. So sometimes this stuff that I say is viewed as a little anti-scientific, and it's exactly the opposite. You know, what I'm trying to do is to show how awe is an essential part of science, but we should also at the same time be careful not to think that science is completely like, not to equate science with truth, you know, because truth is a very dangerous and and elusive kind of word, you know. And the problem with these ultimate theories of everything, which philosophically don't that the whole that that assumption, it's nonsense, right? You cannot have an ultimate theory of everything or anything, because knowledge is always advancing. Right. You cannot say that, OK, we are having a theory of everything now because we have the four forces of nature, you know, gravity, electromagnetism and the weak and strong nuclear forces. That's it, folks. All we have to do now is bring them all together and we have a theory of everything. But then how do you how can you say that knowing that hey, in five or ten years? Some some guy or person in some laboratory may discover discover a fifth force of nature. You go, damn. Okay, my theory now is incomplete. It's not the theory of everything anymore. It's the theory of almost everything. And the point is that you have to put that one in. And so I think there is a lot of hubris, you know, in making final affirmations about our knowledge of anything, including science. Beauty at Work is brought to you by Templeton Religion Trust. If you enjoyed this clip, go check out the full episode. And please take a moment to subscribe and leave us a review. It really helps get the word out about the show. Thanks and see you next time.